Uh, we're talking today to Professor Callum Roberts, uh, Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of York and longtime campaigner on ocean issues, whose new book, Ocean of Life, How Our Seas Are Changing, has come out just in time for Rio and hopefully just in time for the oceans. We're talking today about the problems affecting the oceans and the solutions that we need to find for them. Welcome, Callum. Hello. In The Ocean of Life and also in your previous book, uh, The Unnatural History of the Sea, you do a lot of big historical context. You look at what's happened to the ocean over centuries, if not millennia. We've already degraded the ocean so much compared to a thousand years ago, 500 years ago. When is there a point where it can go no further? Uh, is marine extinction on a mass scale really possible? I think we're getting very close to that right now, that we're, we're reaching a point of no return in many parts of the sea. So that uh, this continual ratcheting down of the condition of life in the sea is, is leading to oceans literally without fish, uh, seas without oxygen, places that are dysfunctional because we're seeing increasing toxic algal blooms, for example. Those kinds of problems are, are, are growing and coalescing across bigger and bigger regional areas of the oceans. And I think that if we want to see the seas as places that are enjoyable to go to, that we can rely on as a place to dispose of our wastes effectively, to continue to catch fish, to be healthy to swim in, we have to do something about it now. In the book, you talk about the way we run fisheries at the moment being like a Ponzi scheme, like a dud investment scheme. Can you explain? Yes, the uh, biologist Daniel Pauly from the University of British Columbia in Canada very memory, memorably described fishing as a Ponzi scheme. And in a Ponzi investment, uh, investors are paid from the deposits of uh, previous investors. And so what you have is something which is using up the capital of the stock rather than living off the interest that that cap capital is generating. Fisheries are much the same because instead of living off the sustainable income from a fish stock, we're, we're eating into the stocks themselves. And so we've been going around the world fishing down the capital in our account rather than uh, using the interest. A lot of the problem with fishing is to do with the way we fish, the destructive fishing gear. Tell us about bottom trawling, what it does and why it's a problem. Bottom trawling is a technique which goes all the way back to the Middle Ages and it involves dragging a net behind a boat along the seabed and it's very good at catching fish, which is probably why it hasn't been phased out. But the problem is that it has a lot of collateral impacts on other wildlife. It destroys seabed habitats as those nets are being dragged along, anything that happens to be there and has its head stuck up above the bottom is going to be swept away. So corals, sponges, sea fans, uh, all sorts of things living on the bottom are, are, are just not able to cope with a pass of a bottom trawl. And uh, the other problem that they have is they're not very selective. And so they, they, they catch a lot of animals that are really not worth having and uh, should be left in the sea as part of their natural ecosystem. So bottom trawling is a, a bad fishing method because of these destructive tendencies that it has. We're hearing more and more about deep sea fishing, fishing that's occurring further out and deeper down as stocks closer to land run out. Can deep sea fishing be done sustainably? Deep sea fishing is virtually never sustainable, uh, using economically viable methods to extract fish from the deep sea, which means big boats, big nets, uh, huge long lines that stretch tens of kilometers. These are methods which uh, may be appropriate in shallow waters where productivity is high, but in the deep sea, life proceeds at a glacial pace. And uh, so those animals, the, the creatures of the deep, live incredibly slow lives. And that means they have very low productivity. We simply shouldn't be fishing in the deep sea in the first place. And I would like to see all fishing deeper than 800 meters phased out from the world oceans. Climate change is also having a big impact on the oceans, warming water and acidifying water. Tell us what it's doing. Both warming and ocean acidification are manifestations of climate change and they're causing an increase in the amount of stress in the oceans for a whole uh, swathes of marine life but also they are changing the oceans profoundly and in ways that we haven't seen for millions and millions of years. 
So warming uh, first is, is causing changes in uh, currents and circulation. It's changing the strength of upwellings, which are bringing nutrients to the surface. It's uh, enabling species to move into places where they haven't been for uh, a long time in the past. It's, it's shrinking their range in other places. So the oceans are in a state of flux. A acidification, though, is a, a major and only recently recognized aspect of climate change. And it comes about through the emissions of greenhouse gases, and in particular, carbon dioxide. When you dissolve carbon dioxide in a can of fizzy drink, you, you get something which has got an acidic tang to it. That's from the carbonic acid. The same thing happens when carbon dioxide dissolves in the oceans. So the oceans are becoming more acid, and they're now 30% more acid than they were in pre-industrial times. That's making life very difficult for animals that deposit chalky shells or skeletons. So things like mollusks and corals and uh, tiny microscopic plankton called coccolithophores, they're all going to find their lives increasingly affected by ocean acidification in the coming decades. We're hearing lots more about an increase in so-called dead zones. Can you explain how they occur and what they do? The seas are usually quite short of nutrients, uh, but in places where there's a lot of nutrients, you can get very high productivity. The trouble is that uh, uh, you can swiftly turn a gift into a curse when you excessively fertilize an area of sea. And uh, that happens where agricultural runoff is pouring fertilizing nutrients into the oceans, and you get a bloom in, in plankton growth and the plankton ends up falling to the seabed. It doesn't get consumed often because there's overfishing going on too, and it builds up in great drifts, and it sucks up all the oxygen from the water as it rots, and you end up with a dead zone devoid of life. Nowadays, across the world, there are at least 400 recognized dead zones, many of which are permanent, some which form seasonally, and one of the largest is at the mouth of the Mississippi River in America, as it flows into the Gulf of Mexico, that can cover 20,000 square kilometers uh, at the peak of summer. One of the big solutions that's been posited in recent times for the oceans is increasing the number of marine protected areas. Is it really feasible and, and, and how do we police it? We have seen some miraculous results from the establishment of marine protected areas that are put off limits to fishing. And within a period of only a few years, you start to see a recovery of life within those areas. Animals that have been knocked down in abundance by fishing start to build up again. And I've seen in the Caribbean, in marine reserves there, increases of three, four, five fold in the abundance of commercially important fish within a period of five or seven years of the onset of protection. So if they're well protected, marine reserves can be a, a really powerful tool for recovering life in the oceans. And I think that we need to roll them out across larger and larger areas of the sea if they're going to make a real contribution to revitalizing uh, the, the health of the oceans. And at the moment, the Convention on Biological Diversity has a target for establishing 10% of the seas as marine protected areas by 2020. In my view, that's not enough, though. We need to see it as a waypoint on uh, a trajectory that will move us towards something more like 30% of the seas protected from all fishing, uh, hopefully before the middle of this century. Obviously, marine protected areas can't be fenced off from what's happening in terms of climate change in the ocean. Can you explain a bit more their role as a buffer for ocean life? Well, we have... Uh, coming ahead, a, a real crisis for the oceans and the land alike, and that is the expansion of the human population to 9 billion by 2050, and it could continue to expand to 2100, maybe reaching even 11 billion. Uh, we simply don't know. So the driver of change in the oceans is, is only set to, to get worse. We're also struggling to come to grips with controlling climate uh, through greenhouse gas emissions. And so the driver there for change in the oceans is likely to get worse. So I think what we can say with confidence is that things will get worse before they get better and possibly much worse. What we need to do in the sea is to give the oceans uh, a fighting chance of surviving these difficult times ahead. And that means rebuilding life in the sea to much higher levels than it currently is.
Fishing has knocked down the amount of life in the sea, uh, bigger things by 75 to even up to close to 100% in the last century or so. What we now need to do is to deliberately rebuild the abundance of life to much higher levels, both for the purposes of fisheries, which will be more productive at those high levels, but also to give resilience to the oceans as a whole to cope with the, uh, the, the stresses of all these other effects that we're having on the sea. Your book, The Ocean of Life, has come out just uh, ahead of the United Nations Earth Summit, the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainability. Talk about the Law of the Sea Convention and how Rio can have an impact in terms of making that more effective. I think we need to see a, a reform of the way that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea works. At the moment, there are huge loopholes in its implementation. And although nations that have signed up to UNCLOS, as it's called, uh, agree not to overexploit the resources of the high seas, there are many nations that haven't signed up. And they're free to continue to do literally what they like there. It's as if um, you were free to rob a house because you refused to recognize the law against burglary. We simply can't have some nations deciding to go it alone and, uh, and carry on with business as usual while the majority of the world's nations are trying to protect the resources for the future of, of humankind. One of the real flaws in the process of decision making over the oceans that we see today is that most decisions are made by consensus. So you have to have everybody agree to something before it will happen. And we have seen this uh, mechanism be flawed in many circumstances. Once, for example, at the United Nations, there was a, a very close vote to ban deep sea bottom trawling, which failed at the last minute due to Iceland and Japan and, uh, and a few other nations basically saying that they didn't agree to it. And so it was watered down. We see it happening all the time in regional fisheries management organizations where uh, a failure to agree on uh, measures to restrain fishing and to rebuild stocks has simply led to the continued over-exploitation of those stocks just at the behest of a small number of countries, a minority, who refuse to sign up to uh, more conservation-minded schemes. The world is too small to afford that kind of decision-making nowadays, and I think we have to see uh, more binding forms of majority decision-making uh, uh, move into play. We've known about the effects of climate change for some time now. We also know about the dangers of destructive logging practices and getting rid of forests. Ordinary people have a lot to worry about, especially in these times. We've not been particularly successful in protecting life on land. Why should people care about what's happening in the ocean? The oceans overwhelmingly dominate life on this planet. In fact, they take up something like 95% of the living space of the planet. So if you put terrestrial environment into context, it's not that important. What keeps this whole planet working and uh, living and breathing and cycling of nutrients and all of those things that underpin life as we know it is the oceans. And if we want to continue to occupy uh, a pleasant and green and productive land, then we will need to keep the oceans in good condition. We mess with them at our peril.